Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna to be talking about reflection coefficients, but specifically as they relate to conjugate matching. Now, somebody out there in the audience left a very nice note for me from my personal website based on an article that I had written on the Altium blog that was talking about conjugate matching versus reflection matching. So basically in this article, I explore the difference between a complex conjugate matching condition for transmission lines and components and a non-complex conjugate matching condition, or the traditional way you would see a reflection coefficient. So why do we even bring this up and where are these two things in contest? Well, they come into contest in simulation programs and they also come into contest in measurements. So I'm gonna run over the difference between these types of reflection coefficients in this video and especially how they relate to different definitions of best parameters. Let's go ahead and get started. So before we get started talking about reflection coefficients and conjugate matching, first I wanna take a look at this note that was left for me from my contact form on my personal website. Zach, I want to congratulate you for understanding that getting the max power to the load and getting gamma equals zero are one and the same thing. They both require load impedance equals a complex conjugate of source impedance. Well, thank you very much, sir. And of course, I've left out your personal contact information so that people don't start spamming you but I do wanna thank you very much for that kind note. So if you go back to transmission line theory and you start looking at how waves propagate towards a load and reflect from a load, you will often see the following relation defining the reflection coefficient. So this should be well known to most designers. The reflection coefficient, gamma, states that the amount of a wave reflected is the load impedance minus the input or the source impedance divided by the sum of the two impedances. Now, if you're familiar with circuit theory, which of course every engineer in the audience should be familiar with, you're probably familiar with the maximum power transfer theorem, or MPTT. So the maximum power transfer theorem is pretty simple. It states that if we have a circuit with a source voltage and it's connected to two impedances, we'll just call this Z1 and Z2, how much power is transferred to Z2 given a value of Z1? Well, the power that is delivered to Z2 is just the source voltage squared multiplied by Z2 divided by Z1 plus Z2 squared. So this is essentially just the current squared multiplied by the impedance that gives us the power. Pretty simple. And of course, you can then maximize this when Z1 is equal to the conjugate of Z2. So if the two impedances are complex conjugates of each other, the reactive portions cancel out, and then this maximizes the power that's delivered to Z2. Based on this conjugate matching concept, there's actually another reflection coefficient that can be defined in terms of a load impedance and the complex conjugate of a source impedance, and that coefficient is given by this equation. We have the complex conjugate of the source in the numerator, and then we still have the sum of impedances in the denominator. So which of these two situations is correct? One of these has to be correct. They can't be both correct simultaneously, can they? Well, there's one thing that you should notice immediately, and it relates to the source impedance. If the source impedance, Z sub S, is purely real, so we have imaginary part of this equal to zero, then it's equal to its own complex conjugate. And so in that case, for a purely real source, we actually have these two reflection coefficients being equal to each other. So that's one way that they're consolidated. In fact, if you're dealing with a situation where you're taking a measurement and you're using a real reference impedance, such as in a vector network analyzer, then these two situations are actually equivalent to each other because by definition, that reference impedance is purely real Generally, it's 50 ohms. So first, let's take a look at this reflection coefficient where we don't have a complex conjugate. And let's see how we can actually derive this and where it actually comes from. First, this comes from a particular S-parameter definition, and it is derived in terms of voltages for the waves that are traveling on a transmission line. And for this region, this is sometimes called the voltage 
reflection coefficient. So it is the reflection in the voltage wave that is traveling down the transmission line. Now that is something that is physically measurable. You can induce standing waves on a transmission line and you can measure the voltage associated with those waves through their electric field. Now, the definition of the A and B terms in the S parameter equation for this reflection coefficient are just given by these values. So A1 is just given by the voltage plus the current times Z0 divided by two square root of the real part of Z0. The B term is given in terms of the complex conjugate of Z0. So B is equal to V minus I times the complex conjugate of Z0 divided by two square root of the real part of Z0. These are the A and B coefficient definitions that correspond to this voltage reflection wave. That's the first part that's important because if you're taking a measurement or you're doing a simulation and then you're trying to determine S parameters from injected and reflected and transmitted voltages and currents, these are the relations that you would use in order to then calculate a reflection coefficient. So you have to start with these definitions in your calculations to then get to this reflection coefficient to be valid. So you can also derive this reflection coefficient directly from transmission line theory. And the derivation is actually pretty simple. It just uses Kirchhoff's laws as applied to voltage and current waves interacting with the transmission line and the load. So let's just suppose for a moment that our Kirchhoff voltage law is satisfied for our incident wave minus our reflected wave. And then that's gonna be the voltage that is dropped across the load. Now, typically the way that we would actually write this is to write a plus and then a negative sign here just to indicate that the phase is reversed on this wave. We can just go ahead and leave it like this. Next, we have the current being injected into the line incident plus the current that is reflected traveling in the opposite direction is just equal to the current being dropped across the load. So now we have to ask, how do we then relate this back to the voltages and the impedances? Well, the incident current is just given by the incident voltage divided by the impedance it's interacting with. And then here we have a negative sign and this is the reflected voltage divided by the impedance it's interacting with. Then if we just take the ratio of these two, we get a load impedance. So taking the ratio would give us a load impedance. And then from there, you can go through and calculate what is the ratio of reflected divided by incident in terms of your impedances. And you will arrive at this reflection coefficient. So I won't spend the next five minutes going through the math because it is something that you should know how to do and I'll let everybody that's watching the video go through the derivation by hand if you want to. I'll also post a link to a reference from LibreText that actually goes and outlines this derivation. It is based entirely on this ratio of voltage wave amplitudes that you then calculate using transmission line theory. So next, let's look at the reflection coefficient for power. The reflection coefficient that uses the complex conjugate is a power reflection coefficient. So we'd have a P subscript here, and then we'd have the complex conjugate operation right here. This is your power reflection coefficient. And this is a reflection coefficient that was originally used in Kurokawa's original paper on S parameters. If you remember from our earlier discussions on S parameters, I believe I had mentioned that Kurokawa was the person who came up with this concept. And in it, he used this reflection coefficient to define a reflection of power waves. So this should be interesting because power waves are not actually a physical thing. You don't measure power waves. What you can measure is voltage and current, or you can measure electric and magnetic field. And from that, you can calculate a power or a wave intensity or something else that's related to energy. But you're not measuring that power directly. Now, in terms of the S parameters and in terms of the input and output powers from a two port network, we would have an alternative definition of A and B. A sub I is going to be equal to a phase factor multiplied by square root of the real part of the reference impedance divided by two times the magnitude of the reference impedance. And then we have another term, which is the voltage 
plus i times the reference impedance. This is our A value. For the B value, we have something really similar. We have this exact same fraction, so I'm not gonna rewrite it out, but it's the same fraction, multiplied by V minus I Z ref. If we have a situation where the source is purely real, in this case, equivalent to a reference being purely real for a transmitted wave, or for a wave reflecting off of a load. In this case, with the reference being purely real, we've just reduced to the exact same situation that we had before with the voltage wave coefficients. So keep that in mind. They're always gonna be equivalent when the reference impedance is purely real. This is one of the reasons that, of course, in a vector network analyzer or another measurement instrument, you have a purely real reference impedance. So I think the point here to take away from all of this is as follows. The power wave reflection coefficient is going to be different from the voltage wave reflection coefficient because they are inherently different. One is just the voltage, the other is essentially the product of voltage and current, and the voltage and current may not be in phase. Therefore, you would naturally expect that when the voltage and current are not in phase, the equivalent power wave that you calculate will also not be maximized for a given impedance when there is some reactance in this term. So that should be very clear. And that's exactly what we see when we have a case with just basic circuits in the maximum power transfer theorem. The other reason that this is important is because of what happens in simulation programs. So some simulation programs might actually use this definition for A and B. And as such, if you were to calculate a reflection coefficient just using your voltage and current measurements, it wouldn't match the reflection coefficient that the program might spit out because the program might be spitting out this reflection coefficient versus the voltage wave reflection coefficient. So I've read online that ADS, back when it was still owned by Agilent, actually used this definition of A and B in order to do transmission line simulations and to do S-parameter calculations. I don't know if that's still the case because I'm not currently an ADS user, but if anybody out there is an ADS user and can comment on all of this, We'd love to hear from you, so make sure to leave a comment in the comments section. So, which reflection coefficient should you use? Well, like I said earlier, it just depends what reflection you're talking about. Is it a power wave, which is a mathematical entity, or is it a voltage wave, which is something you actually measure? Well, that's up to you to figure out. Just make sure that you understand the difference between the two when you're doing your calculations. All right, thanks everybody for watching this. Make sure to check out the articles I've linked in the description. And of course, make sure to hit that subscribe button to keep up with all of our upcoming tutorials and all of our videos. And last but not least, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.